Hi there, this is The Guilty Knitter, um, episode 18, I believe, um, you know, coming to you from Montreal, Canada, and um, I've been probably a month since my last podcast, been away for a while, say hi to Monty, poor Monty, he's been sick, he had, um, well, he, st he gets this recurring um, sinus thing infection it might be a tooth abscess we don't know exactly anyway he so he does all this sneezing and snorting and uh, anyway he's been on antibiotics the whole time I was gone I was away on on tour with the orchestra for three weeks and my friend was looking after him and giving him his antibiotics and it seems to be better but not a hundred percent so but anyway Little guy, he's getting old. He seems to want to sit in my lap, so I'm gonna to try to manage that. Um, <clears throat> so it's a horrible, dreary day, March 31st in Montreal, and uh, so I don't have any choice except to put on some some um, uh, artificial light and not go by the light that's coming in, which is uh, not sufficient. Uh, it's, yeah, it's cold, it's rainy, but at least it's not snow. This is, you know, small mercies. When I was away in, in Europe, actually, the weather was a lot like this, cold and rainy, but it was still a step up from minus 20 and snowy, so. I don't mind winter, but after a while, it does wear you down. So, I thought I would, um, yeah, it was just nice to be away for a bit. Um, let me just see if I can move this just hold once all right is that a little better yeah i'm a little closer my hair is getting so long that i had to put it up in a ponytail it just is driving me up the wall um while i was away i was desperate so i should have really had it done before i left but i didn't so it's been up in a ponytail quite a bit lately um okay so i'm the guilty knitter and you can find me on ravelry as the guilty knitter and on Instagram as at Guilty Knitter and on Twitter as OSMViv, O-S-M-V-I-V. Because um, I play with the Orchestre Symphonique de Montréal, so that's where the OSM comes from. I'm a trombone player. Um, and I moonlight as a knitter, <laughs> or vice versa, I can never figure that out. <laughs> and I'm here to talk to you about my whips and my finished objects and stuff like that and I thought I would probably intersperse things with some of my um, knitting or not knitting my uh, adventures in in Europe uh, the last few weeks I mean it was it was a working trip so I didn't have that much time to look around but there's always a few hours here and there and we did have a, I had a couple of days before the tour started, Dave and I, my husband and I, <clears throat> were in Cologne for three nights and then the tour started in Dusseldorf, which is right next door basically. <clears throat> and then um, I, we ended the tour in Berlin and Erica, my daughter, met us in, uh, in Berlin and so we had a really nice few days at the end of the tour together and uh, so yeah it's it was pretty that was the highlight of my tour was seeing was seeing Erica but um, I've been on a lot of these tours and they they are tiring they're really a slog sometimes um, of course it's fun to check out other halls and play music in these great venues um, in Berlin and Vienna particularly uh, Hamburg and um, Cologne, no, we didn't play in Cologne, um, Munich, yeah, there were a lot of really beautiful places, um, 
But uh, I just get so tired. I guess I'm getting too old for this junk. <laughs> you know, moving from place to place almost every day, and it, it's it's just too much. Playing playing a lot, and uh, it's hard to um, describe. People find think it's extremely glamorous, but it yeah. After you've done a couple of them, they they lose a bit of the glamour. <laughs> and you get older, and it just gets harder. The young folks don't seem to mind. They go out and they, they take every spare minute to go and uh, check out the city and um, experience everything. And I think that's great. And they stay up late and they party and they somehow drag themselves to the rehearsal the next day. <laughs> I just think, nope, I've been there, done that, and it's too late now for me. So, yeah, but I have to do knitting things. Um, I have some finished objects. I have some whips. Oh, one of the things I wanted to say, there were a couple of other women on the tour, three, I guess there were maybe three other knitters um, that I know of uh, who were with the orchestra. And um, one of them is extremely experienced and she doesn't need any help at all. But the other two were less experienced. And um, I think some, I think they, one of them said they actually brought their knitting on the tour because they knew I was going to be there and I could help them out and I thought, oh, that's so sweet because everybody knows I'm a knitter and I'm always like knitting at work and I'm always, or I should say, not, you know, obviously not on stage, but backstage or during lunch hour. Um, so they all know I'm a knitter and I'm always wearing my knitted things. So um, I thought that was kind of fun and I really actually enjoyed it a lot, just giving them you know, trying to help them with their projects. Um, they're pretty basic things. But it made me realize how important it is to learn to read your own knitting because <clears throat> it's the only, I mean, it's the only way you're going to progress, really, without having to run to somebody for help all the time. Not that I minded at all. I enjoyed it. But if it were me, I would, I would always want to try to figure things out if I can. That's been my way since... Since I, you know, since I started, of course I had to ask for help a lot more when I first got back into knitting. But, but I um, now I, I hardly ever ask for help really. Um, I should, I mean, I, I can always check YouTube if I'm stuck with something, you know. Um, so I don't know. I just think it's really important to to understand how your knitting should look if it's right. And how it should, how it looks if it's wrong, and also to evaluate how um, important the mistake is. Let's say you have a mistake. Uh, for instance, I I was doing the heel of this sock, which is I, I'll just talk about this because it's my uh, one of my finished objects. Uh, just hold on one second. I'm gonna get a sock. Off. Hi again. Um, yeah, so I, I finished these socks that have been on my needles forever. Um, uh, they're from my husband. As you can see, he's got pretty big feet. Uh, they're, uh, this is knitted, knit on, in um, Garn Drops, Garn Studio um, Fable pad, um, yarn. And uh, I really love the colors and the, and the pattern. And it, so I bought it specifically to make Dave, Dave a pair of socks because he loves colorful socks. And, um, but I, I, yeah, anyway, as I was getting back, I'll get back to this, the rest of my saga with the, um, with learning to read your knits because there was a problem, I had a problem with the heel and I was going along and of course I wasn't really paying all that much attention because I was on a roll and I was doing the slip you know when you slip one and knit one and you make this kind of not a not the eye of the partridge but a similar thing where you just do like lines of slip stitches uh, and I suddenly looked at it and realized that I had dropped a stitch and it wasn't really that obvious and, and maybe if I wasn't such an, an ex, you know fairly experienced knitter I might not have noticed it but um, I could see where the lines were converging at a certain point. And I thought, oh, that doesn't look right. So I looked a little more carefully, and sure enough, there was a, um, a stitch that I you know, dropped. And for some reason, when I do these slip stitch um, heels, it, it happens 
once in a while. So I, you know, I fixed it, but I didn't do a great job of fixing it because I didn't really feel like undoing the whole thing uh, or, you know, frogging it down to that point. So I did the best I could in just pulling the stitch up. But I didn't have a crochet hook and it was kind of annoying. So I might not have slipped every one that I was supposed to. I might have, anyway. So it doesn't look super fantastic, but it's the heel of a sock. You know, it's Dave's sock. He doesn't care. He's never gonna notice. And I decided to just let it go because if I had let that, that drop stitch go, that would have been major, a major problem because that doesn't go away. You know, it would have just continued to slip down and, and create a hole. But um, but once I picked up that stitch, uh, whatever I did with it, you know, whether I got the knitting and the slipping properly done, didn't really matter. It was just an aesthetic. So um, yeah, so that's what I'm talking about. Like you have to evaluate your mistakes and say, is this something I can live with or not? And if it's not, then you need to take it out and do it properly. And and some people are way pickier than I am. Like obviously there are people who would have definitely just frogged it because they really want those lines to be perfect. And I'm like, that's fine. That's good. For me, I'm just not, I just don't really care that much. So I gotta do one thing. I'll be right back. Hi guys. Uh, I'm just interrupting my own program to show you some of these beautiful photos. Well, I hope they're beautiful from my trip uh, to Europe. Uh, the beginning is uh, from Paris, the Musée d'Orsay, and, uh, and then there's some pictures from Berlin, and uh, you'll see a couple of photos of the Berlin Wall. East End Gallery and um, and some pictures of um, some fun we had so I hope you enjoy my little photo gallery uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about my um, my socks uh, in the finished object section but I wanted to talk more about um, my knitting during this tour because, uh, mm, by the way, I'm using my Guilty Knitter mug designed by my niece. I think she did such a lovely job. Just what an artist she is. Look at that. That's supposed to be me and Monty and my yarn and a trombone. Is there somewhere? Do you see it? can't really see it myself, but it's there somewhere. My curly hair, my flowers that I love. She got everything in there. So, um, yeah, sorry, distracted. So when I was on the tour, you know, there were a lot of stressful days, long, tiring days, and I did, there were a lot of bus trips, so, and plane trips. So I did quite a bit of knitting on those, on those trips, which was great. But, um, what was really nice is those moments when I would really didn't have a lot of time. Let's say it was, um, sorry, I got Monty here again. Um, let's say we got, you know, I got back to the hotel and I had an hour the, to relax. I would pick up my knitting and just knit a few rows. And um, it just was, it just viscerally just relaxing. It just like, there's something so, um, I don't know, pulls you down to earth, pulls you, grounds you, I guess that's the word. Um, and that, that's, it was such a, it was such a great thing to have, um, to, you know, so portable, kind of like a, a meditative thing you can just carry around with you and, anyway, use anywhere you want. It's wonderful. I don't need to tell you, you guys are already converts, but, um, <laughs> But anyway, just thought I'd mention it. But also, it was just really nice to feel like I was helpful to these other knitters. Um, and I realized that that's something that I, I'd like to do more of, you know, maybe teach knitting at some point. Um, I don't know, maybe my retirement, <laughs> I'll look into that. Uh, who knows? But uh, I also just want to get better at it so that I I can be more helpful to people and learn a lot of new techniques and different things. Um, yeah, 
so that I can I can have more skills to bring to people. A little more tea. Look, check him out. I've got to show you. Where is he? Oh, there he is. <laughs> He's so cute. Oh, he's so silly too. Okay, so that's that. I probably have more to talk about, but it will come up later, I'm sure. So I'll show you my finished objects. Since I already started talking about the socks, I will I'll talk more. I'll just mention a little bit about them. And they're not blocked yet, so there's still a little bit of a line because I use Magic Loop and. It's not like there's really, um, there's no uh, ladder or anything, but you know, until I block it, there's a bit of a line there. Um, but um, I, I use 2.25 millimeter needles, and um, this is, uh, as I said, Garn Studio Drops Fable. It's a lovely, a lovely pattern on there. And it's so fun the way it just, it makes you, you know, it's not quite as boring as a plain sock, let's put it that way. And I always use this, uh, kind of get, I always go back to this same, the same heel, which I got from, um, hmm, gosh, it's a toe-up sock recipe, uh, pattern. Um, I have to, I'll put it down here. I always use it, and now I always forget what it's called. But um, basically it's the same thing. It's just like a vanilla sock, with this, uh, because it's toe up, it's, they call it a faux heel flap because it's not exactly, it's not the exact same um, method, but it ends up looking like a heel flap. Um, yeah, somebody somebody on the uh, on my tour, there was a, yes, that's right, there was a guy who also knitted and he, I guess I helped him a little bit with a sock he was, he was knitting. He's coming along like, when he leaps and bounds, he, um, and he says he watches my um, my podcast, so I'm going to say hi to Dakota. Hi, Dakota. I hope you're watching. Um, and it was funny because his name is Dakota Martin, and Dave was on the tour, and he's David Martin. And they at one point they got their rooms mixed up <laughs> because the the um, the envelope just said D Martin on both envelopes, and so they were in each other's rooms. Yeah, I guess that was. Yeah, it must have been in Paris, because that was the only time we had separate rooms, Dave and I. Because um, I decided we needed a break in the middle just to have a little space. <laughs> and um, I think that must have been there that uh, that they got their rooms mixed up. I don't know. Anyway, um, it was funny. So Dakota is getting to be quite a good knitter, and he is um, he's making socks. And... Uh, I, I, he, he was doing the top-down version of, of the heel flap, and um, he said he, he didn't really like that part where you have to pick up the stitches around the flap, and, and I was like, I can't even remember how that goes, because I haven't made a cuff-down sock in so long. But um, the, uh, anyway, I like this pattern. It's fun. And I, I've tried other ones. I've tried after hot thought the afterthought heels. Um, they're not bad, but I find that this just gives you a little bit more, I feel like it's sturdier, it gives you a little more room in your heel. Um, for Dave, he is a big foot, so I, I def he definitely needs the room that uh, that this kind of heel provides, I think. Like, he just he needs that space. Whereas an afterthought heel is can, uh, can be a little bit tight. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but... I've even tried the uh, Fish Lips Kiss heel. I never really finished that. I ended up um, pretty sure I didn't finish it. I can't remember why, but I'm gonna try that again sometime. But I don't know. For some reason, I was I really like doing this heel. The process I find is just fun. So, so that's that. Um, and I just did a two by two rib. And actually, I made a mistake in the rib too, as you can see. I I did at one point where I was turning the corners. I did four stitches instead of two in the rib but you know what again no one's gonna notice I didn't do it on this one uh, so there you go um, all right so and he wore them he tried them on and they seem to fit so I'm pretty excited with you know he's got size 13 sock uh, shoes so uh, yeah who knows 
if that was, I wasn't sure it was going to work. Okay, so my next finished object is my vest, which I'm sure I've talked about before. Um, and I made this, made this pattern up myself, pretty much. Um, I decided what I wanted, which was, uh, I have to put Monty down so I can show you. Um, I wanted a, you know, I wanted this length just below the hips. Um, I wanted the, can you see the split hem? And I put a faux seam in here, which I just did by doing a purl stitch all the way up. Um, and right, I, I had a little bit of an issue with getting this, uh, the right, um, you know, to, to be the right uh, gauge and stuff. So I, I fussed around with, with my needles a little bit changing. I came in a little bit here and a little bit out again and then just did, picked up stitches around here, around here, did a little ribbing, put these eyelets in here. I don't know, I'm just, I'm really happy with it. I don't, I don't suppose, my, my daughter, I asked my daughter if she liked it and she was like, oh yeah, it's nice. Obviously, like, she, it's not the height of fashion or anything, but it's such a cozy thing to have to throw on underneath something for when you're layering it. So I was really happy I finished it just before, like, the day I left on tour, I finished it, blocked, you know, put in, woven the ends, and I just gave it a little steam block. And um, it's uh, it's been great. It was really great over the... The tour to have just another layering piece because I, I didn't you know I didn't quite know how the weather was gonna be like over there it was quite rainy and cold so so I had layers and layers I had a, my green coat which uh, yeah and I had my uh, vertices unite which was which actually goes really well with my green coat I'll have to put a picture of of me in this in my green coat. I'll put one in here with my Vertices Unite and my green coat. Anyways, quite the colorful person, I must say. I mean, I think most people in Germany are a little staid, for, you know, color-wise. I shouldn't say that in case there's anybody from Germany watching. <laughs> but uh, depending on the area, of course, and whatever in the, in the culture. But so there you go. This is I'm actually making another Vertices Unite, but that is for the future. I'm just finishing up. I'll finish up talking about my my vest, which I, I'm just calling the Lima vest because I made it in Drops Lima, which is a combination of merino and alpaca. And I double stranded it with Habu silk, uh, Tsumagi silk it's called. And um, I just happen to have this black silk thread and I I didn't know when I was going to be using it. I was I initially, initially bought it to make um, a little tank top in silk with two other colors uh, but I decided what the heck I'm, I just wanted to use it for this and it, it does create a, a really nice um, pattern I mean you won't you don't really notice that it's double stranded at all really because there's no sheen or anything but it um, creates a really nice fabric and it gives it more structure than some than the merino silk might or the merino alpaca might have had by itself um, I will be having to be careful when I wash it and I washed it by hand, blocked it this week when I got home and uh, it came out really well. So very happy with it. And I don't plan to write out the pattern anytime soon. I didn't keep proper notes, so I don't know how I would, I'd probably have to make another one and I don't know if I'm really up for that. It was fun to do, to make up my own pattern. And I did follow like the decreases, the sort of um, technique for the for the this part, and the and the, you know getting to here. I kind of um, took from another pattern I had of a tank top I made um, a few years ago. So that's that. Uh, what, those are my finished objects. I don't think I have anything else. So now heading into works in progress. Um, yeah, so I'm making this cardigan by Shannon Cook. It's, um, it is called the Timber Cardigan, and it's a top-down construction, as you can see. And that's, it kind of has this sort of stiff collar that stands up. 
I'm a little concerned that the collar might be a little narrow, but I brought it into Espastrico before I left and Mona thought it was going to be okay, that I should trust the pattern. Because it is my size, I am getting gauge, that it's probably going to be fine. Because this is going to stretch out a little bit. I mean, it's, um, yeah, I think it's, I hope it's going to be fine. Anyway, we'll see. But it's a very, very lovely yarn. It's Shelter by Brooklyn Tweed. It has these gorgeous um, flecks of um, red and a little bit of blue in it. And I just love it. I love these Tweedy type of yarns. And the construction is really fun because you have all this twisted rib at the top. And then that goes right into this detail on the shoulder. Uh, which is, I guess, right here. Yeah, this is the shoulder. And it goes right down the arm and it goes right down the back, see? Um, yeah, well, let's see, can I see? Yeah, so you see there's that panel there with two sections of twisted rib kind of stripes. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's really fun. I mean, I have to be careful with these long rows that I don't overdo it. I can't spend a lot of time, um, you know, at once. I can't do it for two, three hours, these long rows, because it, it really does start to hurt my arm, my, you know, in here kind of thing. I don't want to get tendonitis or tennis elbow or something like that. Hmm. Excuse me. Um... And so I, when you, when I first started the after the after the twisted rib collar, which is very straightforward, you start having to divide and um, uh, increase for the shoulders in the back, and she asks you to insert markers along as you go, and that was I mean that took me it took me a way way too long to do that row where you insert all the markers. I mean, I couldn't believe how long it took me. I was, mind you, I was doing it at the store uh, during one of the, um, during one of the knitting circles. That was probably not wise. But anyway, I finally got it done and there were a ton of markers along here. Uh, you know, just around the collar as you start the increases. And um, I, I knew that it was important to put those in, those markers in, or you know, because you, when once the structure is clear, you you can maybe uh, I eventually like after a few rows even like maybe ten rows I took them out because they were just getting in my way, and I could see how the structure was gonna was working. I could see the the spine, I could the spine of the shoulder, and I could see where the increases had to be, and so I didn't need the the the. Um, didn't need the markers anymore. So I took them out um, and that was fine. I didn't make any mistakes except except to the one spot where it was not as clear to me where I should be doing a twisted rib and where I shouldn't be doing a twisted rib. So I eventually put two markers back in to show me because there was this one spot, well two spots, where it could have gone either way. I, I must say it's not there's a couple of spots that don't look 100% beautiful along here. And I, I, anyway, I just wanted to make sure that I didn't forget to do the twisted rib where I was supposed to do it. So I did put these two in to show me. But um, other than that, I didn't really need it. And, and even when I got back from, from my tour, and I hadn't well, looked at this for a while, I was able to figure out where I was just from my stitch count. And, um, and uh, yeah, it came back pretty quickly. So that was good. But I mean, when it comes to markers, they can really serve an important purpose, obviously. And some people depend on them 100%, and they wouldn't have taken them out maybe. But for me, I, I find that they just are annoying. You know, if, if, they're, if I don't need them, I'll take them out. Um, that's it, that's my rule. If I do need them, then I need them, then I definitely need them. And sometimes they're just a really good um, sort of reminder of where you are. If you can read your knitting, if you can tell where those where those increases are supposed to happen, it really helps a lot um, to facilitate to sort of bring your knitting along. You know, 
because that's just so that's part of learning to read your knitting and I think that's a real that's for me it's vital you need to figure out what the mistake is and, and how to fix it and um, yeah there's this one spot here that actually I never did figure out what I did but it's not so bad I think it's okay can you see it no you're not gonna be able to see it I'm gonna show it to you so yeah I would definitely recommend this knit it's fun it's actually fast I mean if you weren't like me and kind of um, you know sort of uh, I'm kind of prone to a little bit of pain aches and pains here and there and I, I really just have to be careful I think that you can you could whip this off in a very short time and I'm really excited to get it finished and wear it and um, yeah so it is made yeah Brooklyn shelter in the thistle colorway which is just I love it I would had so much trouble choosing the purple shade I wanted because there were I don't know at least four different shades of purple that Brooklyn Sheep puts out uh, Brooklyn Shelter puts out in no what am I saying Brooklyn Tweed puts out in shelter there must have been at least four that I, that I liked <clears throat> and then the next day a friend of mine came came into the store with the very one that I had been debating over then she was knitting a sweater in that color, so and that's Nyla, and I bet Nyla's watching too. So hi, Nyla. Um, I think it was Nyla. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Nyla. Um, anyway, it's um, lovely, lovely knit. It it could be I you know I debated about doing this because there's a lot of purling involved, um, and I'm not a big fan of purling, as some of you know. Um, but it, it, I've gotten kind of used to my continental purling. I, I did come across a video that, um, uh, what's her name, um, Roxanne Richardson put out about her method for, for knitting that she used for many years, which was uh, called uh, lever knitting. And it kind of makes the purling a lot easier. It, but it's a, type of, it's a type of throwing, or at least you hold the yarn in your right hand and um, I think it would be kind of kind of cool to 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 get comfortable with that. Uh, it's it's basically holding the yarn in your okay. You're holding it in your right hand. So let's see. I would let me see. I need my glasses. I can show it to you. You know, this is this is the kind of knitting that if you know Stephanie Pearl McPhee, who is the yarn harlot, this is the kind of knitting she does. And and uh, and it comes from cottage knitting, where you would take a long, a long uh, knitting needle and stick it under your armpit and not move it really, and you'd only move the left needle, and you'd be like, I don't know how you, yeah, I can't really show it to you with with a circular needle, but you can adapt it, the method to circular knitting uh, by, uh, oh yeah. Um, By holding the yarn like a pen, like a what would you call it? I guess like a pencil, right? So you're holding it on, in between your thumb and, and forefinger, and you knit like so. So you're, oops, that didn't work. Um, okay, bring this around here. Of course, I'm not really used to it, but so you kind of you hold it like this. Hold on. And you, ah, dang it. All right, all right, like that. And I'm knitting through the back loop. So anyway, it's not, obviously I don't have it down to a fine art, but it's supposed to be a lot faster. I don't know. That will have to. That remains to be seen, but eventually, it becomes. I don't know if I'd want to do it uh, like a ribbing like this. I find it's quite, kind of a little bit, you know, um, laborious. I guess that's the word I want, because you have to change over all the time. And but the idea is you're not dropping the needle completely. With your right arm and that's the, kind of the difference between this kind of knitting and uh, 
like and plain throwing. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think I want to try it on a project where that's all I do. Hi there again. My uh, knitting, my camera has a tendency to turn itself off. I don't know why. I thought it was full. My, I still have only an eight gigabyte card in there. <laughs> so pathetic. I really need to buy another one. Um, but it's not full, so I don't know what happened. Um, anyway, so that's it. I'm, so I'm definitely going to try that lever knitting for one pro complete project. Like, I don't know, for a pair of socks maybe, or I don't know, some little thing that I can see if I like it, you know, see if I can um, get the hang of it and see if it's faster, see if it's more comfortable. Anyway, any way you do it, you can hurt yourself if you try to do it too much. So, um, so that's my, my progress on my timber sweater. And I hope that I'll get that finished uh, sometime soon so I can show you. And here's my next finished object, or not finished object, work in progress, which is my newest, my Vertices Unite, which was my tour project. I, at the very last second, I thought I need something that's just really straightforward and easy. And I was, and I thought I was going to make this, gosh, I can't remember what it was now. But it was going to be another pretty straightforward shawl, I think. Um, but I decided instead to cast on another Vertices Unite because I've always wanted to make another one. And it's just so fun. And it is like all knitting. And, and you know, the only tricky bits are, the, are where you start the new sections. And they're not that tricky. And you can just look at it for a little bit and you get the hang of it. So I've already finished the... the I finished the second section so here's my here's the first section and it's quite big but it's not this is a smaller version than the one i i showed you earlier this is kind of a medium i did i did uh um just between the small and the and the large basically i, I chose a medium size and a friend of mine linda has done had done one f recently so she kind of gave me the what she did, which was to increase, instead of increasing to 90 stitches in the second, or no, in the first section. So they like, you start from nothing and you, and you, you know, you keep going until you have 90 stitches or something. She just picked a different number. So she, you know, she went to 78 or something like that. So I did the same thing. I hope I'm not giving away too much of the pattern, the paid pattern by Stephen West. First season night, it's probably one of his favorite most famous patterns and I definitely recommend it because it's a lot of fun so I had I really wanted to use this gorgeous black and dream bow um, with, for, for this and I chose this this koi goo to go with it to stripe the first section so I thought I mean, I'll put this up really close so you can see can you see that pretty well there's a lot of purple, I mean, there's that beautiful red and then a little bit of gold. And so I went to a store in, um, in Vienna actually called Volavine. Volavine. My German is pretty bad. And uh, I, looked at, I looked at a bunch of yarn and I was trying to find colors that would go. I, originally I was going to go with a, a dark purple and stripe that with something. I had some of this dark purple. Uh, but I didn't have quite enough and anyway but then I thought you know what I really want to bring out is that beautiful red it's just I really liked it so that's why I picked this um, this which is 100% cashmere, cashmere June cashmere it's called in the, the scarlet colorway and then I chose this to kind of pull out the more neutral tones this sort of yellow that's in here it's not very you know, visible, but <clears throat> but it thought it went quite nicely. Anyway, I'm quite happy with it. I know it's a little crazy for some people, but <laughs> I do love my my colors, and these are not my colors. Come to think of it, I mean, I would never normally pick this color, but look at that. It looks quite nice with that, and this so nice. Uh, my next, and I also bought this. Um, this Merino 200, which is their their um, store make, store brand, Volavine, 
and um, it's just merino, 100% merino. And this one, I had, I really bought this. I'm like, so there's this whole section in the middle, which is this huge rectangle on the, in the big version. And I'm doing that, I think I'm gonna do that pink square or rectangle, I mean, in this blue. Um, I think it's gonna look good, but I'm gonna try it. And, you know, I'll just start it out and see if I like it. And I can always pull it out quite easily and choose something else. We'll find something. And I have to start, I have to figure it out pretty soon because I'm at the end of that first, or the second section. So, yeah. And I think I have to put this on some waste yarn. I'm not sure. I forget how it works. So, yeah, I had to average down by buying this five euro skein of yarn here because these two were a lot more than five can I just say <laughs> um, I don't know I didn't buy very much on this tour I really didn't I mean what back in the day when I was uh, young and foolish and, and I'd go on these these tours to exotic places I just bought so much stuff I felt like I had to buy stuff for my kids and I and I wanted to buy things for them of course because they were young and it's fun to spoil children <laughs> with things. But, um, yeah, I don't do that anymore because people don't need so much stuff. That's what I've learned through hard, you know, through examination of my own life. I don't need so much stuff and neither does anybody else, really, that, we, that I know. Um, I, so, I didn't buy very much. I bought some chocolate to give as gifts and um, some coffee and I bought myself some yarn and I thought well if it's a bit expensive it'll be a really nice um, it's just fun to work with it's lovely and um, and it's a good memento from my trip from Vienna Vienna is, is a beautiful city but and there's so much there's such a musical tradition there it's fun to go by different streets and they're all named after composers Liststrasse and um, uh, Wagner this and Strauss that and anyway it's fun um, on the other hand they have a long tradition of um, being a little bit misogynist in their um, in the way they hire musicians there I'm sorry to say there's um, it's been difficult for women traditionally to make a living as a musician because they are we're often not hired um, so I think that's changing now, but it's uh, it's been a bit long in coming, I think, personally. Um, so I wrote a blog post about that, by the way, if you want to check it out, it's on Vivian's Tranquil Garden, um, which I use as my sort of eclectic blog. I used to just talk, I used to just um, write about my gardening, and that was how it started. That's why it's called Vivian's Tranquil Garden. But now I use it for anything that comes to mind, basically. Um, and so, yeah, so I did write about that. Okay, so I'm getting to the end of my podcast. I, um, yeah, I had to empty my memory card because it got full, which tells me that I'm probably, I should probably sign off because this could get too long. Um, I do. If ever, if this is if you're a new viewer, um, welcome to the podcast. And if you are a returning viewer, thank you so much for coming back. And I appreciate any comments um, and feedback. Uh, if you want to know anything about the projects I've talked to, I'm, I talked about today. All everything is on my project pages. I'm pretty good at keeping notes. Um, I do have a. Um, uh, yeah, page for the podcast on Ravelry, but it's not very active right now. So I might um, I might start a new thread for introductions because I haven't done that for a long time. And uh, so yeah, if you're new and, and or if you haven't introduced yourself yet, then feel free to do so over there. And um, uh, yeah, and definitely subscribe and hit the thumbs up if you liked the video. Uh, I looked back on um, 
all my videos um, today for just how to look at you know kind of the stats around all my episodes and I think I've only had one thumbs down <laughs> which is great I guess I mean I don't know why anyone would bother putting a thumbs down on a on a knitting video really like whatever yes if you did enjoy it I mean as I said um, please share it with your friends and write uh, a comment or whatever I um, certainly love to get feedback and um, follow me on Instagram if you feel like it um, at Guilty Knitter as I said it'll be out in early April tomorrow is the first of April so okay so take it easy and uh, happy knitting and come on back next time bye